without further ado, I will introduce our fabulous speaker, Jason Riddle. So Jason Riddle is the National Chapter Coordinator for America's Future Foundation. He joined the AF team in 2012 as the chairman and co-founder of AF's Atlanta Chapter. For two years, he was a producer and co-host of a business and economics talk radio show in Atlanta where he had the opportunity to interview several U.S. senators, political commentators, best-selling authors, policy analysts, economists, and business leaders. His writings have been published in the Freeman, the Peachtree Papers, and on his blog, Freedom Unfiltered. Let's welcome Jason Rowe. Doesn't help at all? No. You, no hear yourself, nope. you hear yourself breathing. How about now? Like How about now? Is that, yeah. You hear yourself breathing. It's weird. Maybe if I stand just right here. How's this? Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Crystal. And thank you very much to the AF Atlanta chapter for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. This is a, a topic, liberty and equality, that I'm very passionate about. I think it's a very important topic. And I think that this is one of those uh, unique issues that advocates for liberty can actually make a lot of inroads with our friends on the left and our friends on the uh, on the right. Both, um, or I should say, most people I think in this in this particular area share a lot of the same goals, but it's just the the means of how to get there. At times, can be very very different. So tonight, uh, how this is going to work? I want it to be a little bit more of an interactive discussion, a guided discussion. I have some points I want to touch on. But I don't want to just be up here presenting to everybody. Uh, I want your feedback too. I want questions. I want us talking together uh, and, and really sharing the knowledge. We don't all have the answers. So I want, I want us to um, really work with each other to get a little bit closer to the truth. I'm going to start off talking just a little bit about liberty, a little bit about human freedom, why it's important, uh, why we should value it, why we're all here tonight. And then um, talk about a couple different flavors of equality and which of those types of equality uh, might be compatible with, li uh, with individual liberty, which types of equality uh, we might want to be a little bit suspect of, some considerations we should think about each one. Uh, and then if we have time, I have a good surprise at the end, but we've got a lot of content to get through, so we're just going to have to see how far we can go. So the first, first point that I really wanted to bring up, or question that I wanted to raise is, are we free people? Are you a free person? What does it mean to be a free person? And that can mean, of course, a lot of different things. Are you free from your stress at work? Are you free to get up out of this room and, and walk away? Um, are you free not to be spied on by the IRS? Maybe not. Um, but in the context of this conversation, I really want to focus on a couple characteristics of freedom being uh, an ability, a capacity that we all share, and really focusing here that a free person is somebody who has the ability to deliberate. So we see maybe some different ways that we could possibly do things. We can think about that. We can deliberate, we can make choices, we can decide what we want to do. And then generally speaking, we're able to, to act on our choices. So our decisions, we feel, are up to us. And, and that's pretty closely related to our ideas about morality, our ideas about justice. It, it's really hard to attribute blameworthiness or even praiseworthiness to, to somebody whose decisions aren't really up to them, right? That's our, our legal system. Uh, if somebody's acting under duress, that could be a mitigating circumstance for really assigning blame to how somebody acts. So we want to really focus on the fact that people are rational, we deliberate, we make choices, and then those decisions, to the extent that we can make them and we feel like they're up to us, that allows us to be free people. So why do we care? Why are we here? I think that probably, I hope everybody in this room intuitively has this feeling that freedom, that individual liberty, and I apologize for the resolution up here, but that uh, it's, it's a good thing that it's worth fighting for. You can't read entirely this quote down here, um, but it's from the Declaration for Scottish Independence, written in 1320. And it says, not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we are fighting for freedom. Oh, it's not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we are fighting, but for freedom. For that alone, which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. That's a powerful world, uh, a powerful word. Uh, people fight and die for freedom. People fight and die so that their children have an opportunity, a chance for freedom. Uh, again, it's closely related with our ideas about morality, right and wrong. 
Um, it was uh, John Stuart Mill, great philosopher. He felt that people being free and free to make moral decisions, um, that you can exercise those type of moral capacities, kind of like you'd exercise a physical muscle. And if you're not free to exercise your moral capacities, then you really couldn't develop into what it really means to be a human being. Uh, obviously, it's closely related to ideas like dignity, uh, human rights. Uh, a lot of very, very important ideas are, are closely related to individual liberty. And it allows us to do a lot of other things that we think are important um, to live a good, dignified human life, self-actualization, intellectual pursuits, uh, ability to, to go out and get nice material things that we enjoy doing. Anybody have any thoughts on freedom? Do they like it? Is it? I don't think it should be a tough sell for this crowd, but <laughs> does everybody like freedom, think it's a good thing? Yeah. So I'll probably say this a couple times tonight, but if nothing else, I really, really want you to remember this. I want you to take this point home. Um, this is something that one of my favorite contemporary philosophers, his name's Jerry Gauss, uh, and since this screen's not showing very well, I'll start walking around a little bit. Um, he's over at the University of Arizona, and this is something that he really stresses. It's called the presumption in favor of liberty. It's closely related to his fundamental liberal principle. And I'm not talking about liberal in the progressive sense of the term, but liberal regarding freedom. And Professor Gauss, he says that freedom is normatively basic. So in political philosophy, we're talking about normative uh, rules, um, considerations that's related to morality, to ethics, those types of things. And he's saying that that's fundamentally basic, that it's really hard to even conceive of this idea of morality without the idea of freedom coming first. So freedom's fundamental, freedom's our starting point. And because of that, any limitation, particularly through coercive means, but anytime you want to limit somebody's freedom, that needs to be justified. And the burden for doing that, the burden of proof, so to speak, or what he calls the onus of justification, needs to be set pretty high. So whenever you want to limit somebody's freedom, you have to justify it. Now the flip side of that is that we don't have to justify why we're free. That's our starting point, that's our default starting point is freedom. And if you think about how our, our political system, particularly today once we're so used to the government doing so many things, a lot of the conversations will, will take a, a turn and somebody will say, well now justify why should the government not be involved in that? Or tell me why you think you should be free. And that's the complete opposite approach of what I would recommend and, and what Professor Gauss recommends here. He would say it, it's not the burden of proof isn't on the side of the person who's wanting to explain why they're free. It should be on the side of the person who's limiting freedom. And um, just to give an example, uh, it's, it's something that we all do every day. This is 99.9% this is .9 of our lives. On the walk over here, I live three blocks away, uh, I must have passed probably 25 people, maybe more. And all of these people, uh, I don't know them, they're perfect strangers. We're competing over a lot of the same goodies that we all want to get. We have very different ideas on what we should do and what we should be uh, in life. But not a single one of those people held me down and made me justify to them why I should be free. We initially treat people as free and equal. Now, if I were to, I don't know, snatch up somebody's baby, then I would hope that 25 or more people would tackle me to the sidewalk and limit my freedom and they would have good justification for doing so but does that make sense that their initial starting point our presumption should always be in favor of liberty so why would we ever want to limit freedom and i'm not going to lie i really forced this picture in here i just wanted i wanted to make a slide just so i could show this picture <laughs> ron paul is probably in one of the, the biggest figures, at least recently, advocating for peace and, and liberty. But he's on top of, I don't know, a velociraptor uh, with an automatic weapon and a rocket launcher. <laughs> so I, I thought that, I just wanted to show the picture, but thought, hey, why ever limit freedom? Well, there might be very good reasons why we would want to limit freedom so we don't have the lunatic fringe walking around. I'm just, I'm just joking. I said that tongue in cheek. Um, 
Or, I mean, think of another example. Maybe it, when I was walking over here, I'm on my cell phone, I'm texting, I'm not paying attention, I'm getting ready to walk out into oncoming traffic, and somebody decides they want to grab me out of the way, they limit my freedom, but it's for, for good reasons that I would want them to do so. So there might be very good justifications for limiting freedom. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions about freedom before we jump into the meat of the conversation and talk about equality? Yes, sir. You are not free unless you are free to injure yourself. You're, he said you're not free unless you're free to injure yourself. I think that's a good point. With freedom comes responsibility. That's the other side of the coin, right? Right. You shouldn't walk out of your right. But you want to be So let's talk about equality. Are we equal? Do people do? Do you think we're equal? Should we be equal? Yes. Okay, we've got uh, another about, question about freedom. Uh, are there any uh, rankings that show how the United States stacks up against other countries in terms of uh, in free society? There are. There are. There are several. Um, the ones off the top of my head, I know the Economic Freedom of the World Index. Um, they also have uh, an index particular to freedom of the press. Uh, and, and the United States has been falling on that list over the last couple of years, over the last decade. Um, we've fallen, I know for, for sure, on the Economic Freedom of the World Index out of the top 10. Yeah. The 18 now? Yeah, I think we moved from 10 or 11 down to 18 this past year. So with our, our tax code, our regulatory code, um, government seems to be doing more and more things these days. So the U U.S. has slipped on that scale. So equality. Uh, I was going to make a comment earlier. You said that um, it's in, you implied that it's inherent that people will act rationally when free. Um, so I think that the, the the answer to your question about when freedom should be limited is when people are not acting rationally, but in a way as to harm others and not necessarily themselves. Like he said, um, like what do you think about that? Do you think that do you have faith in everyone to act rationally when they have freedom? No, and I don't. I don't think that all free people necessarily act rationally. I think that that's a big leap. You you don't have to necessarily act rationally to be free. Uh, I would think that it's maybe subtle, but I think that it's being able to exercise your rational capacities to make decisions and the decisions that you feel like are your own, that it's up to you, uh, even if they're bad, very irrational decisions, um, to, to be free. So no, I don't think that, that uh, acting, or I don't think that you have to always, or that people will always act rationally if they're free. In fact, I think the opposite's probably true a lot of the time, most of the time. <laughs> so are you saying a lot of the time, other people should enforce their, their morality on other people who think that they might. Well, be we'll, we'll get to this maybe in a little bit, but if if people are, let's say that we take a, a pessimistic view, which I'm not going to necessarily take. I'll, I'll walk back what I said a second ago. But let's say that people do act more irrationally most of the time. Um, do we want an institution where we have? people that control a lot of other people in charge of making decisions if they might act irrationally like other people. So I think that, that probably to that point, um, maybe a dispersion of decision making might be beneficial or might, even if you're not individually acting rationally all the time, maybe together interacting with a lot of other people, then um, you might be able to sort of help each other like out. Like victim of crimes, like yeah. driving under the influence of alcohol. At what point is that actually harmful to someone else? At what point is it actually harmful to yourself? Well, I think that it's, it, I mean, it's obviously harmful to yourself if you're doing something that's harmful to yourself, and it's harmful to somebody else if you're doing something that's harmful to somebody else. So that's, I mean, a simple answer, but the line in the sand is when you're actually hurting somebody else or threatening to hurt somebody else. We'll, t we'll talk about some of these rules here in a second. So equality, it's obviously a, a very, very broad term. It's, it's a set of principles, it's a, a set of ideas, a set of concepts, it's not just one thing. This picture I like, it's from the, the cartoon adaptation of George Orwell's Animal Farm. It's 
a great book if you haven't read it, and it says all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And that's what I wanted to ask this group in the room. Are people equal? Should we be equal? And really, uh, there are a lot of ideas of what equality means, what equality is. And I just typed in on Google Images, equality, and so it all went, popped up. And the next couple pictures are examples of that. Um, we, we'll see that people have very different ideas of what equality means. First example here, this person says, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but he says equality doesn't mean justice. This is equality where you have a group of kids standing on the same size boxes, the same size crates. Some of them, or one of them at least, cannot see. The other two can see the game. And then according to this person, justice is having a different arrangement of boxes, but everybody can see the game. Everybody has the same view. What do you guys think about this? Is this, uh, when you think about equality, is equality having the same boxes, even if you can't see? No. Is that, exactly. that No. It, 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 this is somebody taking the word justice and, and broad stroking it, rather yeah. than zeroing in on what justice really is, which is justice before the law. You may be more intelligent than me, you can't put more brains in my head or put me on a box to give me more intelligence. It is, you can't, you have to use the justice, the word justice in its right context. And that's when you get the other, you get somebody redefining. So would you say that justice would be having the same size boxes, even if it means that some people can't see? Correct. And equality would be having the same view, even if the boxes are arranged a little bit differently. No, I would say that justice is is using the word in its proper context, which is justice before the law, not justice whether somebody has the same size box. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, would, I would say that it uh, depends on how you define quality. You could have a quality of opportunity or a quality of results. And, uh, that's the difference. On the left, everyone's got the same opportunity. You start with the same, sure. uh, you know, from the same starting point. And on the right, you've got a quality of results where everyone has it. Okay, so maybe a quality of opportunity versus a quality of results. If you, David? Well, I mean, on a side to sort of thing, you know, the government solution here would be to pass a bunch of laws that are going to work well for most people. The real solution here in this picture would be to give parents the authority to step in and set the right size boxes up and do what's right, right for their kids. Not have to rely on the preset laws that might or might not fit with no flexibility. You need the flexibility to do what's right. That's the equality. Right. Or the older kid could assemble the boxes. Because he could see already. I mean, that's like the liberty line, though. There should be a, there should be a third picture. <laughs> <laughs> in this example, I think the word justice should be replaced with either humanity or community. Right. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. It's a very interesting way of thinking about that. Yeah. I don't disagree. So then, same, I mean, this is, this is two rows down. Now this picture shows up. So now we've got, you can't read the top, but it's basically saying they're not justice and equality aren't the same thing, but they complete each other, according to this person. So according to this person, this is justice, where you have the same size boxes, even if somebody can't see. This is equality, now everybody's got the same view. And in their world of justice and equality, you can magically create more boxes, I guess. Um, more taxes. More, yeah. right. So this is, this is, I guess, the government solution right here, that they just create boxes out of nothing. So <laughs> an opportunity for the concept of charity. Now the question is, where is this charity coming from? Do we be coerced of our populace by the government under no law species, but are really doing good by giving all these people these boxes without them having the opportunity to maybe drill holes in the wall and look through at the game and use ingenuity to fix it themselves. Or to allow that tall kid pull something out of his own pocket and give them the boxes. That's the way I sure. 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 
for that help. I could put it on your shoulders and right. then problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the point that we've kind of been, we've got one more, what do you think? Carrie in the back? Um, I was just going to say, I thought about this for a long time, and, and I really struggle with it. But like this lady said, we don't start with the same set of skills, the same abilities, the same initiative, the same drive, the same socioeconomic level. So to me, equality is more letting you build your own blocks and not having somebody come in and knock them down or prohibit you from building your own blocks. That to me is equality. Because yeah. we're never going to be the same. Sure. One more. Ten. This will be the last observation, but if these kids are sneaking over the fence to see a game they didn't buy a ticket for. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think you guys brought up a, a lot of very good points and, and we raised I think each one of these that there are different flavors, there are different types of equality. We have equality of outcome, we have formal equality, so things like equality before the law, equality of opportunity, which is it can be split both ways. You can have equal opportunity to material resources, and you can have equal opportunity, kind of what you were saying in the back, the equal opportunity to pursue your goals without having arbitrary obstacles there knocking you down. Um, but there, there are several different ways to think about equality, and I really wanted to kind of go through each one and, and talk through maybe some considerations that we should take seriously and, and some considerations that uh, maybe are often made that we should be able to, to think a little bit more deeply about. Can everybody see this? So, so socioeconomic equality, equality of outcome. This was another image that I found here. Uh, it comes from the Barclays Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs up in DC. I think you can tell um, which side of the aisle these folks would support. <laughs> but their infographic here shows that 73% of millennials believe that the economic system unfairly favors the wealthy. I'll be honest, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But then the right side of it, it says 69% agree that the government should do more to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. You know, law enforcement, equal application of the law would do a lot to solve income inequality. Especially Can you give an example? Equal enforcement of the law would go a long way to solve inequality, is what he said. Can you give an example of, of what that might look like? John Corzine actually being prosecuted for his billion dollar fraud. Yes. That's just one sure. small check. Mm -hmm. uh, the banker is immune because it's not a trust. You have actually loaned them your money when you deposit it in the bank. So if they lose it all, they're immune. They have no responsibility. Okay. Dorothy? Yeah. When you have crony capitalism, you're always going to have that inequality. When you cut everybody off from the government, no political favors, no situations like this gentleman over here was talking about, then you have a society that, yes, there are going to be those that are very wealthy. But they've done it on their own, and they always have to worry about competition if they slip up. And that's what a free society is all about. And that, to me, is equality. Just allowing people to do their thing. And there are some people who would never put in the effort to become a multimillionaire because they don't want to do it. They'd rather sit there and watch TV. And they should be allowed to do that and feel good about doing it, too. It's OK. But they shouldn't deprive somebody else who's got more drive and more ambition and for whatever reasons, that he'd be allowed to make his millions. Um, I was just going to say, a lot of people are focusing on um, the political aspect of liberty and equality, and uh, I mean, that's very important to focus on the government, but I think the question ultimately comes down to, is a free society going to be a moral society? And no, government cannot enforce morality. I think that that's been proven throughout history, social and economic, it can't enforce morality. Um, but the question is not whether or not people are going to want equality and liberty. I mean, I think that inherently people want to be free and people want to be 
feel like others around them are happy. Um, I think the question is what, like, can we trust, like, what are you going to do as an individual if you are so, ad, you know, advocate liberty? You have to make sure that you go out and live up to that and make sure that you are changing society as an individual so that you can prove that there are ways to go about it without using the government. I think that's a very valuable lesson that we should all take to heart, absolutely. So one of the things that I thought about this when I when I first saw it um, is that a lot of time these statistics will be thrown out to show um, the wealth gap, the one percent, that, that the rich are getting richer, the poor is getting poorer. And if we're truly concerned about the least well-off members in society, uh, I'm not so sure that the wealth gap is really what we should be focusing on or looking at. I think that we should be, uh, for example, uh, John Rawls, who is very much in favor of a lot of these, these social justice um, type things that, that we talk about. Um, great philosopher, and, and he considered a just society to be a society where the least well-off in society were the most advantaged. The least well-off uh, were the best off under these, these types of social arrangements. So if we have a society where there is significant income or wealth inequality, but that inequality actually benefits the lowest members of the society the most, and that's actually, according to Rawls, a, a just society. And on that one particular point, I would certainly agree with them. So maybe it's not as much the inequality, the gap, but I think that there are certain considerations that we should definitely take to heart um, about our social institutions, our economic institutions, our political institutions, and how they affect all groups of society, uh, even if we're not focused on on the, the wealth gap necessarily. Uh, a lot of the libertarians, a lot of conservatives, I think dismiss this issue very quickly as saying that we all need to play by the same rules and it's okay if some of us succeed and some of us don't. Um, but even if there's not nothing inherently unjust about a significant gap or inequality of wealth, I think that like a lot of the comments were made over here, um, that that income equality, inequality, that gap can very well be uh, an indicator of a lot of other injustices that are taking place. Um, things like our current system where we have political privilege, monopoly privilege, regulatory privilege, tax privilege, you go down the list um, that do unfavor or unfairly favor uh, wealthy groups in our society. So it creates and divides people, it divides wealth. And anytime you have a society where uh, income where wealth is is determined by politics instead of markets, I think you're going to find more and more cases where uh, the political system is rigged to favor those people to have money. And I also think that um, when we see that, we're going to have a, a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots. They're going to use that political system to really drive that wedge and maintain their power. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit more, but I think there are a lot of tendencies within the free market to actually create a flatter, more equal playing field um, versus having substantial inequality overall. I think one of the important things to remember is to look at history and realize that our country was the one that brought <coughs> everybody up to a higher standard of living compared to any other system in the world that's ever was tried. And, and even though there was wealthy and what you would call poor compared compared to any other society, there was an uplifting of everybody. A person who starts a uh, company hires people, and by doing that, you uplift the whole society. So it is the most humane, most humane system that's ever been tried. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Uh, one of the takeaways just from, from this thought experiment that I would like to just reiterate is maybe this left side isn't too far off. I mean, I don't want to be an advocate for the system we have today as being the preferable system, right? There are a lot of injustices, economic, political, political social, that exist today. And as advocates for liberty, we should take those very serious, seriously and think about maybe how they cause some of these other concerns, and that could be a good inroad to really start talking to uh, other people that maybe default to this side, thinking that the government should solve their problems. If we at least recognize this side, then we can help through economic teaching, we can help through philosophical teaching, um, better ways of maybe helping address some of their concerns. And, and also equal application of the law. Right. 
Because yes. there's laws from IRS laws to, to monopoly laws yeah. through all of the other <coughs> government contractor laws, all those things that pay for some people or other groups. So I thought that this was another, just by chance as I was doing some searching on the internet as I was preparing for this talk, uh, I found uh, some interesting statistics that were put together by economist Anthony Davies. And he was doing a little bit of research and he wanted to, to better understand the 25 wealthiest people of all time. So 25 wealthiest people throughout history. And of those, only five of them are really modern day folks. The rest existed a little bit farther, bit farther back. And the wealthiest person of all time, uh, name was Mansa Musa of Mali, mm -hmm. who was worth in today's dollars about $400 billion. That's a lot of money, which is a substantial amount, far more than anybody has today. But then um, one of the, the ways that he, he really uh, dug into these stats was he divided not only their wealth, but divided it by the per capita income of the population during the time inflation adjusted to really find out kind of what the average person was making. And he found out that this gentleman right here, his wealth was about 800 million times higher than the average income of the person during that time, compared to Warren Buffett, who is a very wealthy gentleman, but whose wealth is about 8 million times higher than the average person's. Um, so in relative terms, Mansa Musa is about 100 times wealthier than Warren Buffett. So uh, uh, again, I would attribute that in a large part to the advances that we've had in freedom. Uh, free, freer economic systems, I would argue maybe that's a, a conversation for another day, but tend to produce flatter, um, more distributed wealth and, and income earnings. My colleague Sven actually said over here a second ago that each of us is probably a million times richer than Mansa Musa at this point. Oh, that's a good, right. that's a good perspective. Sure, sure. <laughs> but right. yeah. on, on the idea of justice, if you look at the true meaning of the word, it is an ex post idea. Justice is something that's delivered after someone does another person wrong. And if we pervert the word justice toward meaning giving other people what we would want them to have or what they would want to have themselves, then that is completely different from the way that we would normally conceive of that idea. It's ex post, it's after the fact. You can't have justice before anything's been done to somebody else. That's a really good point, Richard, and an excellent segue into the next one that we're talking about, equality of opportunity. So are there, <coughs> are there, I guess, uh, aspects of justice that can be delivered, or is it only after the fact? Is equality of opportunity here, um, are there any ways we can think about equality of opportunity being let's say somebody, an, an unjust arrangement for some people that maybe don't have the education or the nutrition or the money or the training or the physical ability or the intelligence to compete with other people that do. Are there any considerations there that we should think about in terms of equality of opportunity? I certainly think so, but on a humanitarian level, there is, um, especially now, the, poor, the poorest person is able to work himself up the ladder and become extremely wealthy. And there's many stories of, of the successful uh, poverty-ridden child making it in the world. Today, I think it's harder and, uh, because of what's going on. But I think it has to be done in the humanitarian way. Um, Americans are very um, generous. And they do help, and they will help when they see a need. And that's where I think it belongs. Certainly not in government, because government messes things up too badly. So when we're talking about equality of opportunity and uh, equal opportunity, not necessarily to have the same things, but at least an equal opportunity to pursue and, and get the same things, that options are not artificially limited, that we don't have artificial barriers um, to what we're trying to achieve. I have two questions. The first one is to remove a presumption. We are talking about the United States. Right now? Yes. I'm talking about 
humanity. We don't have to talk. We can we can relate it to the United States. Okay. I'm trying to talk about uh, what ideals should we shoot for. What's the what's the best that we can hope for? If we are talking about the United States and the Constitution for the United States of America has five different classes of persons, how can there ever be any wrong? I, I think that that is uh, a very good point and. It's one that is very closely related to the next section that we're going to talk about. So can we put it on hold just for a second? Okay. I think that that's an interesting point. Gretchen, do you have it right now? Matt? Um, well, speaking of the point from the United States, professionally, there's a professional life insurance, uh, which is restrictive and most regulated of different professions. <coughs> just point on one. system folks advocate for uh, subsidizing people that are less well -known. but subsidizing it in an unjust system instead of trying to remove some of the barriers that maybe are causing some of those artificial obstacles that are causing um, some of that inequality of opportunity to begin with. I, I really believe that on a global scale there's uh, everyone has the same opportunity to work their tails off to get where they want to go it all depends on their ambition and their desire and their drive. You have so many who has careers that can put together this really expensive right. college versus they can, they can get scholarships. No, they can. Uh, it's all the millionaires that blow their money in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Believe me, a really expensive college just doesn't give you a good education. It doesn't, but what I'm saying is it does open up opportunities. I think, I think you can be at an advantage, too, in certain situations. You, you know how to think smarter, work harder, be more creative be innovative in particular situations. And I can speak from that personally, from my own experience, and I'm okay with saying, you know? And so I think that it's all about being creative, networking, meeting people, um, establishing a network, being on the go. Um, I, I think that there's more to it than that. And I think that particularly in my profession, you know, I work my butt off and I owe that a lot to my background. And, and I'm grateful for it. You know, because it made me stronger, faster, better, and so I think that it—that's one way of seeing the particular. You know, one way of seeing it. But we have this conversation too about how those are your needs. You have people that all they're doing is trying to find food. Sure. Right. They can't come up here to self actualization. Right. So, and again, I'm not saying I have the answers, but I'm just saying this is a question that we all. Well, and by the same token, there are a lot of people who don't have the same mental capability. Mm -hmm. as, that's as exactly right. To be beyond there is. So. You know, well, the same thing if you remember the Sandlot, one of the yeah. greatest yeah. movies of all time, <laughs> yeah. 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 that Smalls has ever played in the major yeah. leagues. Yeah. He's right. no, he's not Benny the Jet Rodriguez. Yeah. He's not going to play in the major leagues. But then we also had uh, Hambone here, who became a professional wrestler, the great Hambino. Uh, so everybody's got different talents and abilities. Yeah. Yeah. But as long as you, to your point, uh, if you're on the very bottom fighting just to get your daily nutrition to, to survive, you certainly don't have the same equality of opportunity um, as people that, that do have the basic necessities. So again, these are, all of these is, I guess we're getting at, I don't think that they should be too quickly dismissed um, by advocates for liberty, but there are certain considerations that we should think about. And 
and maybe not advocating the government to take care of it, but there are definitely certain needs and um, aspects of humanity that we should all champion. I think you're making the perfect case here for limited government because obviously the culture of dependency that we're creating here, we look back at our parents, we look back at Crystal, people who would work three jobs to get through college, <coughs> now you expect your Pell Grant, you expect your remedial education, you expect um, uh, your, your Hope Scholarship. Um, there's just the expectation that nanny government is there to help you, there's the expectation of handouts and that, that does not translate very well into equality of opportunity and it doesn't uh, translate very well into um, uh, making an effort in, in, in this society. There's a great article that just came out in Psychology Today called A Nation of Wimps. And if we're looking for liberty, right. we are raising children who are turning this country into a nation of wimps. And I encourage you all to Google that article. Yeah. And that is it for entitlement. They, they Rich, no effort. Just I, just, I just think it's important that we know that when we look at equality opportunity, that we don't presuppose that there is equality of aspiration. Right. Because we're going to yeah, but I think it's more aspirational. And, and by that I mean just applying my <coughs> personal example. I lived in a county, in rural Georgia, that had one library, the entire county. Where I live in the county now, we probably have what, close to 30 libraries. But yet, when I look at the actual results, the academic results from those two different counties, one has 30 libraries, one has one, they're about the same. So it really has nothing to do with just how equal the opportunity is, but how willing people are to take advantage of it. Um, I wanted to, to touch on something that you mentioned, uh, I'm not sure of her name, uh, she, she mentioned about the, the disillusionment with the Libertarian Party and the political world um, comes from a lot of people that think, that assume that we don't care or that people that associate with that movement don't care because they, they think that government shouldn't be that segue, which I mean like I said earlier is that it's a, it's a societal thing. I don't necessarily agree that, you know, if someone on a worldwide scale, maybe in the U.S. it's the case that if someone works hard enough they can get to where they want, but there are countries in the world where that's literally not possible. Um, but I don't think that, I, th I think that people are small-minded to focus on the political aspect of it and to put the blame on an individual for associating with a movement and claim that they're not caring simply because they don't believe that politically that government is the option to do that. I think there's a lot of, I mean just in this room there's a lot of different views under that umbrella. So. Yeah, I, I certainly agree, and um, for me it keeps coming back to this idea of um, not creating or advocating for the, the removal of artificial barriers that keep people with different aspirations from achieving and going after their goals. It's, it's really the, the imposition of artificial barriers that we should, as libertarians, I think, strive to, to eliminate. And one of the, the dangers, if we're still, we're not off the topic yet, so I'll the next, but one of the dangers, at least that I see when we talk about equality of opportunity in the fullest sense, um, to really have equality of opportunity, what does that mean? That people eat the same things, that they learn the same things, that they do the same things, that they're actually getting uh, all the same upbringing, and this picture that I borrowed from uh, Pink Floyd shows how, you, you know, you have a danger of basically creating drones of, of people that are all identical, that, and that, I think, is a real danger of, of, lo of losing a lot of important aspects of what it means to be human, and we should celebrate a lot of our diversity instead of necessarily making a one-size-fits-all solution. Ben, what do you think? Uh, just two weeks ago, I was invited. Um, a couple years back, I had been involved with soccer teams. And soccer is uh, a sport that involves a lot of different communities, a lot of different uh, ethnicities, a lot of different people, and a lot of the kids that I was were Mexican, and some of them were illegal, you know, illegal parents, illegal in this country to be here, but uh, one of those kids um, graduated from school, got himself a job, got married, had a child, and he invited me over his home. Now, he's still illegal, he invited me over his home. And one of the children, one of the kids, one of his friends said, have, have you ever noticed how uh, homeless people, you never really find a Mexican homeless person? 
never really see someone of that piece of that left out in the cold because the families are all, all stick together. They all talk to one another and they take care of one another. That's the, and I think culture. that the culture of how they are, and that is a main point is how the cultures transcend that. And we as people need to recognize that. You know, the, you know we can get into a debate over whether these people deserve to be American citizens or not. That's, a, that's, a, that's another thing altogether. But I had an opportunity and I had enough of them of uh, United States constitutions to go around amongst the crowd. And when we got into the discussion of the Constitution, and one of the one of the fathers said that he was pulled over that morning for not having a sticker correctly on his truck, or a light was out, a light was out in his truck. And he was taken to jail, he was let go, he, he, he was forced to pay $800, he was let go. No court date, nothing. This goes to show the, the extent of how, how bad our government has gotten, to the extent, you know, any, no reprimand at all, just pay the $800 and be on your way. But once they understand the law, you know, illegal search and seizure, even though they're not American citizens, they still are, have rights. They're human rights. So I think uh, you know, that goes beyond. Richard? This is another one of those cases where I think the words we use actually confuse the meaning. So the words actually matter? Yeah, words matter. So we have justice. We talk a lot about rights a lot of the time, what's right. But opportunity is one of those confused words, too. Because if you look at what opportunity is, it's not a zero-sum thing. It's not mutually exclusive. If you have opportunity, you're not taking any opportunity away from me and vice versa. So the problem with a government that imposes equality of opportunity from the top goes to Benita's point a second ago about the importance of limited government. When you try to equalize the number and the amount of opportunity that individuals have, you are some way, some meaningful, uh, in some meaningful way, limiting the opportunity of others. I think that, yeah, that's a, a great point. And as you were talking, it reminded me of these two questions that I put up here, these two bullets. Uh, the first one says, a lot of times, it will, to, to preface this a little bit, a lot of times we hear about equality of opportunity, particularly from this administration, talking about uh, an analogy of it being a race. And what happens if the starting point, before the runners even get to the race, is different? You know, somebody has an advantage of starting way ahead. Uh, the other analogy with the race, so what if the starting point's the same, but the runners have unequal access to training or nutrition, those kind of things? Do they really have the same opportunity in the race, and to Richard's point, which is perfect, we're not in a race. We're not all running to the same point. Um, so that I think that that's perfectly valid, and that's a good a, a good way to look at it. Um, kind of, kind of tying that together with this, um, I, I was watching a Learn Liber Liberty video. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Um, it was talking about income mobility and how that should be what we as libertarians or liberty-minded people, whatever we want to uh, call them so ourselves. What, that's what we should be focusing on because uh, the income mobility in the United States is actually quite good compared to, to most countries, even though our economic freedom is kind of terrible. Uh, between like 1980 and 2013, if you, or 2012 or something like that, uh, if you follow the individuals, 80% of people, if you split us up into, into quintiles, 80% of people were in a different quintile than they were previously. So I'm can, like, so I guess to make that a question, how how can we advocate that? Um, as far as how how, are, how can we go about communicating that uh, instead instead of allowing a, a lot of the the status Democrats um, to uh, talk about the income gap because everybody's doing better, but how do we focus on the mobility part? Well, I think um, to your point, tell them to watch a learn liberty. It's a great start. Uh, but it, there's a lot of dangers anytime we're talking in, in terms of collective groups instead of focusing on individuals and how they respond. I think there's value um, that we can certainly look at how institutions, political, social, economic, uh, predictably impact certain groups, but then to talk of people as the rich or the poor uh, without taking into consideration things like maybe 10 years from now, the people that are the poor are not the same people that 
So there is income mobility and well, should be. Excuse me. In answer to what he's asking, uh, if people could uh, familiarize themselves with studies by American Enterprise Institute, mm -hmm. Arthur Brooks, who's the president there, has done a lot of work on income groups, and what he shows is there is a lot of churning. There's churning at the bottom, there's churning at the top. Sure. And this, this is a myth that everyone who has money is going to have money 10 years from now or 20 or 30 years from now. It doesn't happen. Bert Folsom has done a lot of work looking at elites. Elites are usually elites for two or three generations and when their grandchildren blow it. And that is just the truth. And if you don't believe me, wait till you have grandkids. I mean, not, not everyone is born with the same aspirations and the same talent. And there is all this churning in American society. There always has been. And much of this is a myth that the uh, leftists are building up, that these evil rich people, they hold on to their money. Um, I, I don't think uh, the, the government necessarily helps people keep their money. They want the money. What they want is they are giving a privileged group uh, free favors. And uh, some of those people then acquire government. Sure, right? sure. In the interest of time, I just want to keep it moving. We've got a couple couple more points to talk to. But one. Um, Remind me of your name, Barry, brought up a second ago. Equality before the law. This is this is usually the, the gold standard, so to speak, that advocates for liberty uh, traditionally point to. That equality before the law is, is really what we should think about. Equal application under the law. Well, what happens if the law itself is unjust? <coughs> what if we are treated equally under an unjust law? Is that what we want? What if different laws? to different classes of persons. What if different laws apply to different classes of persons? Um, so would you say that that is equality under the law? Would it be uh, a case where the law equally applies to everybody, but it just so happens that if you're in a low class, then that means that... Oh, well, everyone with a blue pen would be so like equal. So um, I don't know, maybe a progressive income tax, would that be an example? No. Um, if you have... about equality before the law is, is this what we should advocate for is there any other qualifiers we should throw in there is equality before the law it is that good if we have equality before the law as long as the law is just so i grew up under apartheid in south africa you know they called it separate but equal it was nothing like that which applied equally to everybody everybody was under apartheid everybody was which under treats apartheid. groups of people very differently <laughs> So that would be an, in, an instance of an unjust law. Um, I think that yeah, equality before the law is the ultimate answer. People are, are born, uh, I mean, as you spoke earlier, liberty and equality, people are born free. Like, it's, it's not like it, we've created this fallacy that government provides us rights and that government provides us these liberties and that we're the meaning to be thankful to them. But we're born, if you're born in a world with no government, you're born completely free. So. Anytime government steps in, it should be, you know, equal. It should be equal opportunity and just. Yeah. Well, again, we're we're starting to run short on time, and there are a couple thoughts that I just wanted to throw out there, and we won't be able to get to them in full. Um, but going back to our idea of what it means to be a free person, a free person, somebody deliberates, thinks, and makes choices, and is able to act by those choices. So even if we have um, a law here that that maybe, in our sense of the word, is just. Um, we still maybe have a relationship where we have lawmakers and law followers, that we have rulers and subjects, that we have a, a group of people, whether it's a dictator, whether it's a collective democracy, whether it's a representative uh, system that we have today, where we have certain people that are making the rules, that are making the laws, and other people that have to follow those laws, whether or not their own good reasons support those laws and those rules. Uh, for example, <coughs> Uh, quality before the law. Let's say that we have 
a, a law that's voted on by everybody uh, or it's voted on by the majority where the government takes and raises everybody's children. The parents no longer can, can raise their kids. That applies equally to everybody. They might have good reasons for doing so. Maybe they can provide them with better food and uh, better education, but I think that that's a very big threat to our idea of individual liberty. That, that really removes individual people from being able to make decisions and act of their own reasons. Uh, so I would say that equality before the law is, is something that we should strive for, but we might need a little bit something extra. And, and where I was going with this, uh, again, we have in each of these, I don't know if you can read this or not, in each of these there are, there are things that are compatible with individual liberty, or at least that we should think about, and there are, are aspects uh, to equality before the law, quality of opportunity, socioeconomic equality, that are maybe not so compatible. And we talked about we talked about a lot of those today. I'll make this available online so you can actually read um, what we're saying here. But I'd like to throw out this idea that is, uh, it, it's relatively new to human history. It's not my idea. Uh, a lot of what I've been talking about tonight has come from a series of articles by Roderick Vaughn, one of my favorite uh, philosophers down at Auburn. And he points out that it's not enough just to have equality under the law. It's not enough to have equal application of the law. But as advocates for liberty, we want equality with the law. We want equality with the lawmakers. The government doesn't have access to some special insight, some uh, special moral authority that the rest of us don't have. We're all free and equal people. And to have true equality is to have equality with the law. Very, very important, the second bullet. This is, I think, really the crux of what it means to advocate the philosophy of liberty. And that's that we shouldn't treat other people as means to our ends. We shouldn't treat other people as objects. Even if we think we have very good intentions, even if we think we want to help people to uh, maybe be better, be better people and, and, and contribute to the charities we think that they should, um, whether or not we think that people should or shouldn't grow certain plants in their yard or put them in their body, um, whatever the, those cases may be, we should not subordinate other people to our goals, our ends. We should treat them as free and equal people. And, and in doing so, really levels the playing field and puts everybody on par with one another. We don't have rule makers and rule followers. We don't have subjects and rulers, but we have free and equal people. And uh, down here again, I don't think we can read it, but I do want to uh, read this quote by Roger Vaughn. He says, libertarian equality involves not merely equality before those who administer the law, but equality with them. Hence, it's libertarianism in the political philosophy sense, not in any uh, sense of the political party. Libertarianism, not state socialism, that deserves the title radical egalitarianism. <laughs> Liberty is the truest form of equality. Last slide. Similar to what we saw before, if we throw in this extra caveat of equality of moral authority, if we throw in this extra caveat of equality with the law, then in my opinion, it makes all of these other equalities that we talked about compatible with individual liberty. It actually helps to advance socioeconomic equality as we talked about free markets of individual people acting of their own reasons tend towards a flatter, flatter distribution of income and wealth. Um, equality of opportunity, if we have equality of moral authority and, and we're not treating other people as objects and commanding them how to live, then we have free people with equal opportunity to gain the things that they want to do to pursue their aspirations. And equality before the law, if we are not subjects of these lawmakers that make the rules and we have to follow them, then not only are we going to have equal application under the law, but the laws are going to be just. So I think that, that that's the ingredient that needs to be put into all of these ideals of equality to really be compatible with individual liberty. And if we had another hour, I would talk about how that would look. That would look. Next one. It involves Hayek. But I'm, I think that that's a pretty good starting uh, stopping point. I'll stop right there. And uh, if we have any last minute thoughts or questions, I'll entertain those. Any thoughts to share with the group? Yeah.
about the quality of the law. And Mr. Shulman and I were discussing earlier before the, uh, about some familiar project mode, which is gun control, is happening in the news right now. And Could you speak up, please? Yeah, sure. Um, something about gun control, something that was familiar with you guys and it's happening in the news now. And what we were asking is it okay to let people who are mentally unstable or mentally ill uh, own the weapons and it's quality for the law. Is that where do you stand on that? I mean, where do we start? Yeah, so, I mean, equality before the law doesn't necessarily mean that all people have to be treated identically, right? Or is that a word? Identical? Um, the, there, are, there are obviously a lot of considerations in terms of what rights or um, what privileges that people have in, in various capacities, and to, rights and privileges can be different things. Like, um, but yeah, to, so just, just because... Um, the law equally applies to everybody in terms of gun control. It doesn't mean that everybody should be able to have a gun or own a gun. There's no reason um, why we should have five-year-olds running around the street with guns. Same for mentally handicapped individuals. Um, same thing for driving a car. I mean, there, there are a lot of things where we want to have, I guess, equality with regard to certain important, relevant aspects of our lives. We don't want to treat all people as identical because people are not identical. Uh, we want to, to be fair, we want to give uh, people with equal capacities, equal opportunity to do certain things, but I don't think that it means that we have to treat everybody walking around on the earth as if they're identical human beings. Yeah, I'm just curious. Any other thoughts? Was this interesting at all? Was it worthwhile? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. saying thank you it's very easy particularly in this day and age where the government is messing up a lot of stuff to get really pessimistic and every one of you that's here tonight is a light for liberty every one of you here tonight can go spread the message of liberty in a positive way uh, and it's far better in my opinion as I put down here to be a light for the panel for liberty than to curse the darkness so go out and be lights for liberty because in the end freedom's gonna win it's good we have we got the truth on our side. Thanks, Jason. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Fred Barnett. I am the chairman and president of America's Future Foundation. It's Atlanta chapter. Uh, I want everyone to give Jason another round of applause. Uh, I'd also like to thank our staff uh, for helping us out tonight. Crystal, Stephanie, Matt, and Jeremy, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks to every one of you for attending. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming out to these events. We've been around for a year now and really seeing some momentum. Our next